I've been to two of the APCARI meetings that uh, they hold in the fall, and, uh, and John is the, uh, the director of the Alberta Prostate Cancer Research Initiative. And uh, what also sort of boggles my mind is how uh, somebody as young as John can, uh, can put together a, a group uh, like he has, which is, uh, uh, has researchers in Edmonton uh, and, uh, and Calgary and, and also at uh, Vanderbilt University in, in Tennessee. Anyway, uh, John holds the, uh, the Frank and Carla Sajonki uh, I'm misspelling there, that should be a J, not a P, in uh, prostate cancer research, uh, and he's also associate professor of oncology in the uh, in, uh, University of Calgary. He heads the, uh, the EPCARI uh, uh, group and uh, the international research team at the CATS uh, Cancer Center in uh, Edmonton. He's going to be talking today generally about EPCARI and a little bit about uh, uh, the registry and, and the biorepository, I hope. And, uh, and I'm sure he'll touch on, uh, on the business of biomarkers and uh, hopefully developing a, a better PSA test that can identify what's indolent and, and what isn't indolent in terms of cancer. Um, something you should know about John is uh, he, he doesn't get much sleep these days because uh, uh, three weeks ago he uh, and his wife had uh, twins and, uh, and so I want to congratulate him on that and, and welcome him to our meeting. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, David. Uh, and thanks so much for the invitation to come down to Calgary and, uh, and talk uh, and for the nice words. Uh, if I'm slurring my speech or if I say the same thing a number of times or I just stop and stare off into space, it's because I haven't really slept for about three weeks. So minimize that. Yours is open. All right. All right. So, uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about a little bit about the uh, prostate cancer research we do. So I am a... Uh, I'm a PhD, not a physician. Uh, my wife is a real doctor. She's a rheumatologist. Uh, my daughter likes to call me a chicken doctor. As you'll see, we, we do a little bit of research on chicken embryos for, uh, with cancer. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today about the initiative we put together in Alberta and beyond uh, to look at issues in prostate cancer and try to solve them with research. So the Alberta Cancer uh, Prostate Cancer Research Initiative is about three years old now. Uh, and it's a Made in Alberta initiative uh, to make innovative research a part of care for those living with prostate cancer. Seems like an obvious thing we should do, uh, but, uh, but you'd be surprised at how, you know, how little of some of the innovative research that goes on here in Alberta and around the world actually makes it to the clinic. And, uh, and so as an initiative, we're trying to uh, accelerate the transfer of, of new ideas, new research, uh, you know, some crazier than others. Uh, in, into the clinic to have an impact on, on, on lives of those living with prostate cancer. So you all probably are familiar with the numbers, but it, sometimes it's nice to see an illustration of what we're dealing with. So prostate cancer is 36% of the newly diagnosed cancers and 10% of all cancer deaths in men. So out of every 100 men in their lifetime, approximately 18 would be diagnosed with prostate cancer. Uh, but we've all heard that prostate cancer is uh, not necessarily the cancer we die with, but that we live with. And uh, so autopsy studies have shown that by the time a, per a man is age 70, up to 80% of men will have some sort of pathologically positive prostate cancer in their prostate. So we know, you know, at least from the pathology standpoint, it's a very prevalent disease. So that begs the question, so who actually succumbs, who is at the, the highest risk of death of prostate cancer? About 3% of men will die of prostate cancer um, out, of, out of every 100 people. And really the big issue is, is we don't really have a good way of telling which three. So we have a hard time trying to figure out how dangerous prostate cancer is a diagnosis. And so a focus of our initiative and, and the research in my lab is, is this particular question. So looking at sort of the, our pathway through a diagnosis of prostate cancer, uh, first there's, there's screening, so whether that would be through PSA, looking at family history, or a digital rectal exam at the family doctor. Uh, we're doing, and then, and then a biopsy. So a biopsy, 18 odd needle pricks through the walnut sized organ. It's a very uncomfortable affair, but we do one million prostate biopsies in North America every year. 
And we also do the, a lot of PSA testing. So unfortunately, while PSA is a very sensitive test, so it can detect PSA really well in your blood, it's not a very specific test in that if you have a high PSA, you only have about a 30 to 50% chance of actually having prostate cancer. So that means there's a lot of biopsies done to really confirm it. And biopsy is not an innocuous procedure. So the risk of hospitalization after biopsy goes up 250%. And, uh, and this, this obviously results in some, some, can result in some pretty serious issues, sepsis and infection. So just to put it into perspective, on the research side of things, if we can increase the accuracy of a prostate test like PSA by 5%, we'd eliminate 165,000 biopsies a year and 7,000 hospitalizations in North America. So, so even improving the test a little bit will have a, a great impact. So, so once you've been diagnosed with prostate cancer, a big question becomes, so what now? And this is where we really have, you know, our information currently, is, you know, with all the technology we have, the information we have is still pretty poor. So we know that 50% of diagnosed prostate cancers are relatively low risk, uh, although we don't know absolutely for sure. Yet 90% of men who have low risk prostate cancer opt for aggressive treatment like surgery or radiation. But we also know that up to 50% of diagnosed prostate cancer would never pose any lethal threat, even if they're never treated. So the issue, though, is which 50%, right? So am I the person who is in the 50% that doesn't need treatment or not? And that's really, uh, really the question that we have to face and a question that research can begin to answer. And we know that opting for treatment comes with dramatic side effects so, and can have a dramatic impact on the quality of life. Uh, of those going through it. Uh, and then when it comes to treatment, it's not like there's one treatment. There are many different options, depending on the severity, age, all these different uh, parameters, you might be offered you know, five different options. And often it's up to the patient to try to negotiate and figure out and ask their friends and, and, and ask members of support groups uh, and maybe several doctors to try to figure out what the best option is. Active surveillance, where you don't have any aggressive treatment, you just monitor things over time. Surgery even comes in a few flavors. We have robotic surgery now, less invasive surgeries. Radiation comes in a few flavors uh, and some new agents. Uh, there's also the, uh, these uh, focal therapies can be very attractive where you're only taking out the part of the prostate we think where the disease is. So cryotherapy and high intensity focused ultrasound. And then there's the drugs that go along with it. So often you'll have a, a surgery and, and a drug, like an androgen ablation drug. So there have been androgen drug, anti-androgen drugs that we've been using for years. But there's some really new, uh, new high-tech ones, uh, enzalutamide and abiraterone that are, have just come on the market that are very effective. But all of these treatments eventually will fail. Uh, and then there's chemotherapy as well, which comes with serious side effects, but in some cases produces a very tangible benefit for patients. So all of these decisions have to be negotiated mainly by the uh, patient uh, and their support group. And currently we simply do not have enough information to make informed decisions. And when we think about it, it's, it's, it's actually it's scary. Like, this, is, this is cancer. This is a significant health issue. So I came up with sort of a short list of things that are easy to, easier to decide on than prostate cancer treatment. So which car to buy? You can go online and find hundreds of thousands of pages, reviews, information on every single car, and you can come to a pretty good decision and that you can feel good about about car to buy. A little more personal question, what tie am I going to wear today? It's an easy decision to make. Much easier, or sorry, easier than deciding your prostate cancer treatment, just because there isn't information available to decide which one. I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> So this is, a, this is a treatment decision that should be better, and research is a way for us to begin to get at that. And we're living in a very exciting time as far as technology goes. We can do things now that we couldn't even imagine 10 years ago. Uh, we understand cancer biology better than we ever have, what's happening in the tumor. Our, our ability to compute data and take big data and, and get some really interesting answers out of it is, is unprecedented. We can design new you know, cancer drugs better than we ever have before with very specific properties. Our ability to image and see inside the human body and look at biology is, is, uh, has come leaps and bounds. And uh, we've really developed some amazing techniques to, to actually engineer nature and uh, to fight back against tumors. For instance, taking viruses and engineering them to attack the tumor and affect the immune system. So this has enabled us to, to really advance personalized medicine. So we're treating an individual instead of a population. 
Uh, we can detect cancers earlier so that we can get curative treatments in place. And, uh, and obviously we can uh, use this technology to develop be better treatments and which will result in better patient care. So it may not seem like it because we've sort of been had a war on cancer for many years. But actually research has had a significant impact on the survival of many cancers. Breast cancer has been studied, uh, you know, quite a lot more intensively than prostate cancer for a longer number of years. We've decreased the mortality of breast cancer by over 50% in the last 40 years. Significant uh, progress. Prostate cancer, we've been focusing on it for less time and less resources have gone to it, although that, that's increasing. 20% increase in survival in prostate cancer uh, over, the, over the past uh, uh, 20 years or so. So research is really, is really making an impact on the, uh, on the experience of uh, being diagnosed and treated with cancer. Um, obviously, we're, we're, we're moving along down the road, but we're not there yet. So, so research isn't sort of a one thing. It's, it can mean different things to different people. Uh, so for, for a, a physician in a, research, sorry, in a hospital, it would be research would be evaluating the practical application of new products or processes. So you already have a new drug. Does it work or not? Does it work better than what we already have? On the more fundamental side, uh, research is learning about the fundamental nature of things without any applications or products in mind. So there are many, many great gifted uh, researchers at universities studying very sort of very specific parts of cells or anatomy or biology with it, never any practical application in mind. And so the idea of our research initiative is to try to bridge the gap between these two kinds of researchers. So clinical research, I did a Photoshop there, if you guys can pick it up, Brian Donnelly. It's the sort of the clinical lead here at the Prostate Cancer Center. He represents, you know, sort of the, the pinnacle of, of clinical research. Basic research, people like me, uh, science geeks. Uh, you know, it's funny, there's a whole movement in basic research to say, basic research, that's pretty denigrating. We're fundamental researchers. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a fundamental researcher. But the idea is that clinical researchers and fundamental researchers can get together to try to bridge that gap and try to bring knowledge from both sides to, uh, to create what we call translational research, which is research with a line of sight to the patient. So, so even though in the lab we're, we're studying very specific fundamental things, we, we're thinking about what the downstream applications might be and, and allowing those to inform what we're doing. I think that's very important. So research with a clear line of sight in the patient. So, so we may be in the lab, um, you know, mixing goblets together, whatever, and come up with a new idea. You know, you know, this cell is behaving a certain way. Maybe if I treat it with this drug, it's going to stop it from moving, and and that could potentially affect maybe immunity, but also cancer, for instance. So, so we we'll get together with maybe a few scientists. We test our ideas in the laboratory. We publish a paper. We maybe maybe get in the paper, whatever. Uh, at that point, as a fundamental scientist, I've finished. I've completed my task. But really, for thinking about the patient, uh, it's just the beginning. So, so there's really a gap there between taking a new idea that you've had in the lab and then you know, using the drug and developing it to a point where it can enter clinical trials to, to evaluate in a patient population, and if successful, eventually enter clinical practice. And what's important to have sort of the, the arrows going to the right, but it's really important in a, in a translational research group that ideas come, you know, both from the laboratory and from the clinic. So, you know, a physician in their day-to-day -day practice can see things in, in patients, uh, and, and then in a discussion with us, in, uh, sort of in, in one of our meetings, say, look, I have this subset of patients that sort of has this side effect. Uh, maybe we can address it with this drug, and we can go back to the lab and sort of test that in our models, and maybe come up with a new treatment. So, so it really is the communication between these two sides of things is really important. And so that's what the Alberta Prostate Cancer Research Initiative uh, was put together to address. Uh, Alberta really, uh, so I came to Alberta four years ago from London, Ontario. I, I built a small translational research group there. Saw an opportunity uh, it, here in Alberta to do something really significant because in Alberta we have a fantastic advantage. We have almost four million people using a single medical system. So we can enroll and follow and get good data on a large body of people and, and big numbers means really confident, uh, high confidence in what we're doing. Uh, the majority of prostate cancer patients will pass through only two clinics in all of Alberta at some point during their, their diagnosis and treatment. So we can capture almost all the patients just by focusing our efforts on two clinics. 
Uh, the inform demographic information clinical data is available for the entire population through electronic records and we can have access to those. Uh, and what's nice about that as well, if we learn something, it gives us the opportunity to potentially make province-wide changes to clinical management that could start in Alberta, be tested in Alberta, and expand to other jurisdictions. And, and exactly, to, to the, we have the opportunity here in Alberta to set an example for other jurisdictions using this model. So, uh, so th about four years ago, uh, we thought, why don't we do this on a province-wide scale? Let's get all the clinicians treating prostate cancer, the clinical trials folks, the nurses, uh, the researchers, uh, involve the universities and collaborators and, and, and biobanks, I'll be talking about that, and commercial partners. Get them all together as one sort of team so that, uh, so that we can discuss the most pertinent research questions, the most pertinent clinical unmet needs, and try to solve them as a group. And, and employ our wider networks to bring in the resources we need to do this. So we brought in sort of all these different people. We have over 120 people now uh, involved in this network, uh, actively engaged. Uh, I'll mention here too, it was through the engagement of, so this is a totally philanthropic driven effort uh, to date. So we had a, a group led by Fred Zajonke in Edmonton, uh, the bird dogs that, that sort of provided the initial funding, the Alberta Cancer Foundation then, uh, we were able to leverage funds from them and the Prostate Cancer Center here in Calgary has been a fantastic partner. Uh, as well, and also Prostate Cancer Canada lately has, has contributed as well to build this team. And, uh, and you can see we were able to recruit a fantastic director, Catalina Vasquez, so I uh, worked with her in London, Ontario. She, uh, without her, none of what, what I'm showing today would be possible. She's absolutely driven uh, and committed to the role of, of building this initiative and really brought together all these. So there's a bunch of names on here in the different fields and uh, that list has grown so it doesn't fit on the slide. So, so obviously we, 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 we got to be somewhat focused. So the overall goal is to build a world-class provincial translational prostate cancer research and training program uh, with with our aims would be to obviously to, to facilitate this translational type of prostate cancer research and to leverage this through facilitating grant applications, big team grant applications that only big teams can compete for uh, nationally and internationally, uh, doing things like ethics protocols. So every time we want to do a clinical trial, we need to file a very complicated set of ethics protocols that need to be approved at the provincial level uh, that a single physician may not have the knowledge or, or the experience to complete, so we facilitate those. And we also support what we call high content clinical trials. So a typical clinical trial will ask a very simple question. Is this new drug better than the old drug? Uh, but if that fails or we get results we don't quite expect, we may not have any idea why that happened. So a high content clinical trial attempts to collect as much data as possible about the individual patients in order to determine is the drug actually being metabolized properly? Is, do we give a high enough dose? If the patient didn't respond, can we figure out why so that we can properly select patients that will respond? So we're doing more, all the clinical trials we're doing in Alberta now in prostate cancer are high content and in the fact we're getting a lot more information so that we can accelerate the, the, the development of these drugs and the approval. So we've also established a registry. It may surprise you to know that there isn't actually a list of all prostate cancer patients and all their information in one place. So we've created an uh, Alberta Provincial Registry that actually allows us to gather all the patients together to look at, you know, de-identify so we don't have names or anything together, but we do have the information so that we can analyze it and, uh, and look at patterns both in, uh, in sort of the demographics of the way things are working but also the biology. And that's important because we've also established the Alberta Prostate Cancer Biorepository which I'll mention now is the, the largest state-of-the-art biobank for prostate cancer patients in the world. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in, uh, in a little bit, but basically if we want to develop a new test or a new therapy, we need real patient information and uh, sample, biosamples in order to validate that test. And it needs to be from a real live population that's current. So that's what the biorepository is, is uh, allowing us to do. And importantly, APCARI is supporting and driving the clinical translation of innovative technologies. So we're looking, you know, we know the biopsies are very invasive, uncomfortable. You can't do one every month. Now, you, know, you don't even want to do them every year. 
So we, it's really a, a goal of ours to develop a novel biofluid-based, non-invasive, so blood or urine-based test to improve both the diagnosis and then the prediction of the future of cancer. And then obviously new treatments to block aggressive and metastatic prostate cancer, those cancers that are most dangerous for patients. So I'll talk quickly about uh, the clinical side of things, so facility and clinical trials. So we've had the MASS trial open for, uh, for a year and a half now. This is evaluating metformin, which is a diabetes drug, which seems to have an, uh, a pretty significant effect in prostate cancer. So looking at the uh, metformin and act patients on active surveillance to see if it, uh, or the effect it has on delaying progression or delaying the need for a definitive treatment like surgery or radiation. Uh, we're also looking at metformin in the premium trial to look at patients who are receiving radiation and antigen deprivation therapy, uh, and that's to reduce both the side effects, but ideally to reduce the progression as well. Uh, and ACT is a study to look at uh, enzalutamide, so this is one of these new generation anti-androgen drugs uh, in patients with localized prostate cancer that are under active surveillance, so enzalutamide really hasn't been used in this population before, so it may have a significant impact. So we've just you know, gone through the ethics and, and we're going to start recruiting patients in the coming months. Just want to highlight uh, uh, the PRIME study. So Prostate Cancer Canada just two days ago committed $1.5 million to the PRIME study that will be led by the Canadian Cancer Trials Group. And, uh, and because, uh, well, I, partly because of Apkari and, and Naved Usmani's uh, uh, participation, he became a principal investigator in this trial along with Bernie Eigel, who actually used to be in Calgary and now is in BC. So Calgary and BC are leading this uh, Canadian-led trial. And this will be to look at uh, either biochemically recurrent or asymptomatic metastatic prostate cancer, either with and without metformin on one of these new androgen deprivation therapies to see, again, if we, uh, in the short term, can decrease side effects, so metabolic syndrome from these uh, treatments, and in the long term, uh, delay progression uh, of, of metastatic or recurrent disease. So this is a good size study that will be well powered when we say it has enough patients to really make a definitive decision on whether this is going to be useful or not. So when we sort of polled all of the researchers throughout Alberta uh, who are interested, who some have done prostate cancer or some have done cancer research that could potentially apply to prostate cancer, we realized there are a lot of exciting discoveries that can apply to prostate cancer right here in Alberta. So for instance, I'll just give a few examples here. So uh, Tarek Bismar, who's a clinical pathologist at the Prostate Cancer Center, also uh, uh, Prostate Cancer Foundation rising star, so this guy is a, both a researcher and a clinician, uh, has come up with uh, a, a gene panel that, uh, that is involved in growth factors, but he, he has used this panel and seems to be better at predicting outcome, so which, which patients will have aggressive, uh, that needs treatment of prostate cancer and which patients may not need treatment. Uh, he developed this several years ago and is working to get this as a, a validated test that can, that can be uh, used in patients uh, in the near term. Morley Hollenberg here at University of Calgary, uh, working with myself and, and uh, uh, fellow Dr. Zilstra from Vanderbilt University, uh, are working on what's called protease activated signaling. So this is a very basic way that cells communicate with each other. Blood cells communicate with blood cell walls. Uh, uh, turns out prostate cancer uh, uh, has a lot of these on their surface and it seems to hijack the signaling that the body uses normally for blood signaling to, to cause prostate cancer to grow. And he's found that not only if you, if you look for these, if you have more of them, it seems to be a bad thing, but also if you treat them with a drug and inhibit them, you can also inhibit the growth of the prostate cancer. So we're very excited about using this both of the, maybe as a diagnostic test and as a treatment. And our group, along with uh, Tarek and Andres and a, a number of other folks in Alberta, are very interested in what we call cell motility. So, so and I'll, I'll describe this in a little more detail in a few minutes, but you imagine that prostate cancer uh, starts in your prostate, uh, but if it stays in your prostate, it's not a big deal. So it has to become motile and start moving for it to be really dangerous. We spend a lot of time developing new, uh, new research on this that I'll talk about in a bit. But that's the research. On the other side of things, we have this great infrastructure. You know, Alberta really, has really uh, benefited from uh, you know, these wonderful investments in infrastructure. So we can do, we're in a world of big data. We can sequence the whole human genome. 
Uh, and we're, so we have big genomics groups here that are now being plugged into this prostate cancer research group. We can do metabolomics, which is another sort of high throughput, basically takes your blood or your urine and looks at every chemical all at the same time to come up with a signature. Uh, proteomics is the same idea, but all your proteins. Uh, and, uh, and in vivo screening, which is basically, instead of testing things in a Petri dish, we're testing them in chicken embryos. Uh, in the labs, we can actually test drugs and new treatments in chicken embryos. That's why I'm the chicken doctor. And I'll show a little bit of that as well. But it's most important. So those are research tools. Uh, uh, we've also got some fantastic clinical stage tools that we can actually use to create a test tomorrow. So we've incorporated this what, nanostring technology is present both in Calgary and Edmonton that allows us to develop a clinical test from any panel of genes, proteins, metabolites, whatever we come up with. Uh, metabolomics, both in Edmonton and, and Calgary. That's Hans Vogel. Uh, he runs the Metabolomics Center here in Calgary. And we can take a test. If we have a panel of metabolites, he can develop a test that's clinically useful, you know, in just a month or so. Uh, cancer microparticles is a new technology we've developed. We've, we've actually uh, found a company in the UK. This guy developed a machine. Uh, he was actually contracted by the military to come up with a machine that works in the field that detects viruses. So basically it was to look at bioweapons in the field. So we developed this sort of lightweight, potentially bulletproof, we haven't tested that, machine that can detect small things in the blood. We're actually using it to detect little tiny fragments of prostate cancer that are floating around in the blood and then to, to develop a blood-based or urine-based test. And it, it's working very well. And other techniques, immuno-PCR is just another example uh, of an adaptation of a test that's currently used in the clinic by diagnostic testing labs, but that's about a thousand times more sensitive. So I'll bring you back here to, to the, uh, the question, basically. You know, we, we know that 18% of men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer. We know that only 3% will die. So how do we try to figure out, you know, what is unique about these, these patients that have the aggressive prostate cancer? And I'll talk a little bit about research done in my lab. Uh, so we know that men with prostate cancer do not die from prostate cancer that stays in their prostate. So it has to leave, it has to metastasize and spread to other organs to become deadly. Uh, and prostate cancer spreads typically, it'll go to the lymph nodes first, it'll go sometimes to the soft tissues, but it really loves to grow in bone. So typically spread to the bone uh, and then growth there uh, is how metastasis develops and, and how it becomes so deadly. And the rate and sort of the survival rates of metastatic and localized prostate cancer bear this out. So if you're diagnosed today with localized prostate cancer that's in your prostate, you have virtually 100% chance of being alive in five years. We do a very good job in North America treating, uh, diagnosing and treating prostate cancer. Uh, it's a scary statistic, but if you're diagnosed with metastatic cancer, uh, your survival rate after five years in North America is just under 30%. It's increasing every year because the treatments are getting better. Uh, if you're not fortunate enough to be born in North America, this drops, can drop down below 10 or even 5%. So some countries have a 3 to 4% survival rate of metastatic cancer after five years. So our current diagnostic tools do not predict whether metastasis will occur, unfortunately. And our current treatments do not prevent or cure metastasis. So there's really an unmet need here uh, that we're working with in the lab. So unfortunately, the cancer cells that are likely to get up and move and move away don't have a big red target on them. So we need to find other ways to, to identify them and, and pick them out and destroy them. So this is where chicken embryos come in. So, so our lab uh, spent a lot of time developing imaging tools to be able to watch cancer as it grows and moves. Because traditionally, cancer experiments in the laboratory have been done uh, in mice, for instance, where they take prostate cancer from, uh, from a patient, they put it in a mouse, they grow it up, but then they kill the mouse, chop out the tumor, slice it up, and look at it under a microscope. So, so we've actually learned a ton about cancer doing that. But as you can appreciate, you really only get a snapshot in space and time of what the cells are doing at any particular time. So you, you can only infer sort of the dynamics of what's going on. So we've developed what we call a video microscopy technique to actually look at prostate cancer cells in real time and what they're doing. And these guys are not sitting still. So we use actually a, a fluorescent protein from a deep sea jellyfish called green fluorescent protein. Uh, in this case, I've just made it black and white, so it's easier to see. And what you're looking at there is a prostate cancer tumor that's growing, and we're using a computer program to sort of track all the movements of the cells. And we can actually track the velocity. This is moving super, okay, it doesn't move quite that fast. You can see the video is about 12 hours. 
But in a 12-hour period, it's, it's kind of scary. So cells are moving, uh, you know, three or four cell body lengths. And they do that. They have genes that sort of make them reach forward, make them grab on, make them pull, uh, and make them let go of the tail. So what we found in 2008, we did a screen, an in vivo screen, and we came up with uh, a, a candidate new drug that had a pretty amazing effect on this model. So on the right side, we have exactly the same kind of tumor, but in this case, we've injected what we call tumor glue, this drug that we discovered. And you can see that the tumor cells themselves are almost completely immobilized. What's interesting, though, is you can see maybe a couple cells moving a little bit. If you, so if you look at this zoomed up cell on the right, you can see that the cell still has the ability to reach forward and grab and pull, but it's completely stuck at the tail. So what this drug does is actually you know, makes the tail of the cells slightly stickier, and that prevents them from detaching. And the consequence of that is that we almost completely stop metastasis. So metastasis in a number of different cancers and a number of different models we've looked at is completely blocked. So this is one of these moments that we live for as, as researchers. And so a principal focus of our research program is to take this tumor glue drug and develop it uh, clinically into a drug that can be used in patients. But, uh, but we know that developing a drug is not straightforward and it's not cheap. So the average drug takes about 15 years to get from idea to clinic and costs roughly a billion dollars. So it can be less, it can be more. So, so we have a long road ahead of us. Now those numbers are, are uh, we're making those numbers smaller. But we thought as a group, as a translational research group, we sort of put our heads together and thought, if we have this drug that seems to identify something on these aggressive tumor cells, maybe we can use it to develop a test to figure out which patients have these tumor cells and really need to be treated. So we, we've been working over the past few years, we developed a pathology test. So this is, pathology is what they do with the biopsy right now. They have pathologist looks at it. So we developed a test that a pathologist can interpret uh, using tumor glue. And we figured out if patients actually, if the tumor glue sticks to their biopsy, they are likely to develop metastasis 10 years earlier than patients who it doesn't stick to. So it seems to be able to discriminate between patients who have the aggressive cancer and, and those that don't. And we also use this, this uh, machine from the UK uh, that detects bioweapons to actually detect prostate cancer particles that also stick to tumor glue in the blood. And in that case, we only need a few drops of blood. So one of the main uh, focuses of our lab and of, uh, uh, of the larger group is to validate this test and bring it to the clinic. So to do that, we, we at the beginning, we uh, underestimated a little bit the work involved, I gotta tell you. So to validate a new blood test, uh, I didn't put up the, the scary slide. The scary slide is that only 1%, less than 1% of new biomarkers actually make it to the clinic. So of all the published cancer biomarkers out there, less than 1% made it to the clinic. And there are a number of reasons. You know, sometimes it's the scientist doesn't have any commercialization experience or doesn't know what to do next. Often, though, it's insufficient patient numbers. In fact, that's the most often reason. They, they tested in 100 patients, works great, but they never do the, the definitive clinical test. In our case, we ran the numbers, 2,500 patients at least, maybe more, up to 4,000. So for that reason, uh, we thought, uh, so we, we searched around the world. Uh, we, we created a collaboration with Vanderbilt University. So they have 6,000 patients they've been collecting blood on for 20 years. So we, we established a collaboration with them. So we can do a retrospective analysis. So we can look at patients who've already been studied, but those patients 10 years, 20 years ago were treated completely different than patients now. So we also need to collect prospectively. So we really needed to look at a current population in Alberta. And for that reason, we created the APCARI uh, Prostate Registry and Biorepository whereby we're recruiting new patients actually before diagnosis. So we're, we're recruiting patients at a number of different clinics. If they have a uh, suspected for cancer and they're going to go get a biopsy, we try to enroll them right then. So we get them before they've had a diagnosis. We collect their blood, urine, some semen, and we collect their tissue, a lot of information about sort of how they're living their life, what they're eating, what other drugs they're taking, so that we can then take those biosamples and validate the test both for diagnosis and, and ideally for prognosis or predicting whether these patients will need uh, aggressive treatment. So, so right now, we're, uh, we're recruiting uh, in a number of centers. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, we've actually recruited almost 1,600 patients already in the, in the last two years. 
Uh, as a result, we have over 100,000 sort of tubes of, of tissue and, and blood and urine that are available both for us to study. So we need, we need two or three tubes to validate our test. We collect 84 tubes per patient. They're tiny tubes, don't worry. We don't drain all your blood or anything. Really. <laughs> it's only a couple tubes that we split into 84. Uh, so, but the great thing about that is, we, so we can validate our test, but we can, you know, Albertans uh, through our research initiative can validate all the tests we come up with. And we also have plenty of uh, a resource now to validate tests from all over the world. Because believe it or not, this kind of biorepository is not available in very many places. So we're working with Toronto, for instance. Uh, so, and they have collected sort of, they, they really just, they collect the blood and they squirt it into a tube and they put a cap on. And they don't split it into aliquots. So if you want the tube, you need to thaw it out and take a little bit. So you can imagine, you can't do many tests on that. Australia has a great biorepository, but they don't have any data attached to the samples. So when you request the samples and you say, I need 500 patients with prostate cancer or 500 without, and I say, just a second, we have to run the numbers. So six months later, <laughs> you get your answer. So it gives you an idea. So we, we really set out to create a state-of-the-art biorepository with live clinical data so that every tube that we have in, in uh, freezer storage, we know exactly who that came from, exactly the history, so that we can answer the question immediately and, uh, and, and get quick results. So like I said, these samples are now available both locally, nationally, and internationally. So, so the way things work now, we're open to five centers. Uh, so we have uh, clinical research staff that are, uh, that are working uh, with the Alberta Cancer, Prostate Cancer Research Initiative. Uh, so they go through the, sort of the doctor's patients that day, identify those patients that are uh, suspect for cancer that are, have a biopsy ordered. Uh, and then uh, they'll be presented the study. And at the time, they'll fill out a questionnaire information on you know, what they're eating, what their lifestyle is, and, and other clinical information. Samples are collected, and then we take the samples and data, we store it in a proprietary, very secure database, uh, and, and we store the samples in the Canadian uh, Biosample Repository, uh, which we negotiate a lifetime lease for. So, so we don't have to pay every year, but uh, at the inset, we, we save the samples indefinitely. Uh, and then those samples are then distributed to the members of the Alberta Prostate Cancer Research Initiative for, in our case, cancer microparticle analysis, for metabolomics by Hans Vogel's group, uh, proteomics for other groups, and then for any other really promising technologies that are developed around the world. We've, we have actually a committee that accepts applications. We review it to see if it's, you know, if it's going to be viable, if they've done the right math, if they need the right number of samples, and then we distribute them. Uh, so, so we have uh, dedicated teams at the different institutes, Cross Cancer Institute, so Nevada Usmani, who, who's running that metformin trial, is also collecting with Peter Venner and, and Scott North. We have some fantastic nurses and physicians uh, working on that. The K. Edmonton Clinic through Ma Ron Moore uh, is collecting samples. The Alberta Urology Institute in Edmonton has a dedicated group of physicians and clinical research staff. Uh, uh, I, a huge recruiter, actually, Prostate Cancer Center. So we have a little bit of a competition between Edmonton and Calgary. So the Prostate Cancer Center opened first and is currently leading the recruitment of patients uh, in Alberta. So you'd be yeah, happy to know through the leadership of Brian Donnelly and, and the hard work of Eric and, and Jeff and a few of the other folks at uh, Prostate Cancer Center, they're doing a great job and have contributed significantly uh, to the biorepository. And we're also collecting at the Tom Baker Cancer Center through Jackson Wu, Dean Ruther, and Dan Danny Heng. So I'll just give you several examples of some of the spin-off sort of uh, benefits that we've found or the, the advantages that we've gained from creating this initiative. So for instance, Movember has, has had a really spectacular fundraising results over the past few years. And as a result, they've created some internet, they've, so they've, because they're in so many countries, they're, able, they're starting these really ambitious international studies. Uh, and we're involved very deeply in two of them. So one of them is looking at prostate cancer outcomes. Actually, they're both looking at prostate cancer outcomes for different patient populations. So patients who've had surgery or patients with advanced metastatic disease. Uh, and what they're doing and what we're doing is comparing outcomes from centers all over the world. So 21 different countries, hundreds, even thousands of different centers. And uh, so recently, so I'm a part of actually the design team that designed uh, the study. And we went through and compared all the databases of all the groups throughout the world and asked the question, so for data that's collected in the past, how many of these centers can we compare and actually get useful results out of? Uh, so 
Unfortunately, only three centers were able to be compared. So Ireland, Australia, and Alberta were the only three databases of sufficient quality to be able to come up with the result. So, so we're, we're actually going to do that analysis, but it tells, it's sort of a validation for us that we, we have a state-of-the-art uh, database. But it's going to allow us to compare the outcomes of folks in Alberta with folks around the world. And if, if for some reason, if we're doing better, we can inform other centers on how to improve their care. If we find somewhere that's doing better than Alberta, we can feed that back to Alberta and improve our care here. So I think it'll be a very useful endeavor. Uh, I'll just quickly mention, uh, we got some other, we got some computer geeks involved in the group. So I was approached uh, a couple years ago by Russ Greiner at University of Alberta, who runs the machine learning group there. And he's, he's really gifted at writing computer programs that take tons and tons and tons of data, sift through it, and come up with very simple predictions. So he, for the brain tumor group, he's come up with a way to sift through the database and predict with patient, which patients will fare better or worse after developing different kinds of brain tumors. So I was very excited to get him working on prostate cancer uh, and, and see if we can improve the prediction of how patients will end up uh, and he can feed in anything. He feeds in like your diet and your, all the information from your blood test. We can also in, in, feed in results from our diagnostic tests as well. And he's come up with very simple tools that both researchers can use to ask questions about uh, diagnostic tools, or most importantly, what physicians as a part of our network can use in their practices to have the most critical data in front of them as they're seeing patients. So this is kind of a busy, this is, he's, he made these slides, so they're kind of busy and computery, but He's created a tool that, that's very easy to use, can be used on a tablet by a physician. They can basically look through all of the patients that have ever been treated in Alberta and ask questions like, okay, so for all my patients that received abiraterone either before surgery or after surgery, how did they do? And a simple graph tells them, actually they did better if they got it before surgery, so that seems like the best way for us to go. So they can write on the fly, look at all of their history and all of the data in Alberta and make to, and, and to inform their decisions. Uh, it also, so surprisingly, with all the computer programs we have and all that AHS is, in, is invested in it, actually the prostate cancer physicians don't have a simple tool that brings up all the information about each patient at once. So there's, sometimes there's paper charts, they have to get information from net care in different places. So, so they've created a tool that allows them to look at all of the information in the same place. Exactly all the information on the biopsy, how the PSA goes over time, what happened after surgery, everything available to a patient all at once. So we're going to roll this out to physicians in the next year uh, throughout Alberta. Uh, so uh, David mentioned our annual symposium. So, so we have two big meetings a year. We have one just coming up in the spring that's more of an operational meeting where we try to figure out our, where our projects are going. Uh, but uh, uh, the APCARI annual symposium we have every year in the fall. October. We try to have it in the mountains somewhere, so th this is Kananaskis last year. Uh, it's really a forum for everybody to get together, physicians, scientists, we have international collaborators to fly in, to really share new research, uh, build and strengthen our collaborations, and brainstorm new ideas for, for new things uh, for the coming year. So, so our sixth, me sixth meeting is coming up in Banff in 2016. And like I said, we have everybody involved. We have stakeholder groups involved, uh, support groups, donors as well. Also, we invite and who, who have attended. Uh, we, every year we have internationally recognized invited speakers, uh, ideally that we want to collaborate with. So this year from the University of Toronto, Andre Drabovich, he's been working actually with, uh, so believe it or not, Apkari has the largest semen biobank in the world. So for some reason, uh, Eric uh, Heinemann at the Prostate Cancer Center is really good at convincing men to donate. Uh, and so uh, this has proved to be very useful from a research perspective. Uh, this uh, Andre at the University of Toronto has been analyzing all the samples uh, from Alberta and has come up with what he thinks is a very compelling potential biopsy or uh, test that can be used on semen to predict the outcome of prostate cancer. We're also having uh, on the same uh, and a similar uh, theme. So Myriad uh, is a genetic testing company has come up with a new test called Prolaris. So for certain patients, maybe undergoing surgery. Uh, it'll, it'll ideally predict whether they also need androgen deprivation therapy. So, so Neil Shore from Carolina Urologic Research Center, who's used this test a lot, it was a part of all the initial clinical testing, is going to come up and talk to us about it to see if it would be suitable for patients around here. Uh, we also, you know, a big part of what we do we need, uh, is sharing information and, and providing information as well. So we've created a web portal, uh, appcari.ca. 
so there's a information, basic information on prostate cancer and a lot of information about what our activities are. Uh, we also have a blog which we update regularly, sort of new research finding by the group, so the fundraising activities we're doing, uh, fun things, uh, and important and, and comments on research findings from around the world. So, so like I said, there's information on prostate cancer, information on all the members of the team, if you're interested, uh, uh, information on the research of all the different groups, Clinical, there's a comprehensive list of clinical trials going on throughout the province. Uh, there's, there's a myriad of ways to get involved or join events and get involved. So, and so my group, for instance, I have about 20 pe 28 people. Uh, almost all of them are involved in some sort of prostate cancer or cancer fundraising event. Uh, five of us last year ran in the Ride to Conquer, or rode in the Ride to Conquer Cancer, which is quite an experience. And so, so we love to get involved and, and encourage others to get involved as well. And like I said, we have blog and we also do fundraising through the site as well. Uh, so if you want to get involved, uh, please do. Please come and visit us at apcari.ca. Sign up for our newsletter. Uh, it is only digital. Uh, we have a Twitter account, which I'm getting the hang of. Uh, read the blog and learn about clinical trials. Uh, ideally, uh, if you know anybody who's at risk for prostate cancer, en encourage them to enroll in our clinical trials. Uh, you know, pretty much every clinic that the, they're going to encounter, we have uh, people enrolling uh, to get on the EPCARI registry and biorepository or to enroll in one of the clinical trials we're supporting. Uh, and feel free to participate in our activities and, and, and events, uh, which you can see more at our website. Uh, so I just want to obviously mention None of the, what we're doing would have been possible. We're, we're, up to this point, we're almost completely philanthropic driven. So Frank Sajanki was uh, diagnosed with prostate cancer 25 years ago now. Uh, he was, uh, so he went through the whole spectrum. He, he lived for many years uh, with localized disease, eventually developed metastatic cancer. He was very fortunate uh, in that he uh, was able to get on new clinical trials as they came up. At a Baradarone trial, he was able to get on right at the outset. He responded for quite a few years. Unfortunately, he succumbed to his disease in 2012. But during the last 10 years of his life, he'd, he very aggressively fundraised uh, to, to, absolute, to create a research chair that allowed for my recruitment to, to the province and, uh, and then was able to leverage through his group, the Bird Dogs, and the Alberta Cancer Foundation, and the participation of the Prostate Cancer Center here in Calgary to create this provincial initiative. So. So, you know, it only takes the efforts of, uh, uh, you know, of, of, uh, of one man to, to, to make quite a difference. Uh, so a little bit about myself. You already heard about the new additions to my family. So right there is my wife, Natalie, and I and our, our two kids. Perfect family, boy, girl. We're just cruising along. We're doing fine. I'll just mention that actually the guy on the right is the reason why I got into cancer research. So my father-in-law, Natalie's father, uh, had metastatic kidney cancer. And he unfortunately passed away from that about 15 years ago. So, so really, I was studying biochemistry when that happened, and I you know, decided to dedicate my life to prostate cancer after that. Um, so recently, we had two new additions to the family. This is Cooper and Kea. And uh, they're fraternal twins. And so everybody I've talked to who's had twins recently has said, you know, as long as you get them in sync and they're aligned, you're, you're golden. Uh, so I think this is perfect pictorial evidence that these guys are not in sync whatsoever. <laughs> so if you look carefully, Cooper's got a really funny smile on his face and, and Kaya is freaking out. So this has been my life for the past three weeks. They're wonderful, don't get me wrong. <laughs> uh, and this is my group here. And uh, from all of us, uh, uh, thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions about uh, what we're doing or what the group's doing. That's not bad for two hours sleep, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, John. You. Yeah. Have you started seeing oncologists using your registrar, your registry, and your your repository um, for making decisions for treatment? Have they started? Is there enough information there yet for them to start using it to make decisions? Great question. We'd like them to use it. Uh, so they're obviously within the group, uh, so the, the database is building, so obviously with a small database there's less, uh, well we have to be very careful how we use the data. So we want to make sure that we have sufficient numbers in the database to be able to make confident decisions. So we're being very careful, having careful discussions about when we roll it out, who we roll it out to first, so that we can, so we're playing that over the next year. So we've created the tool, 
Uh, we're going to sort of beta test it with a few urologists. We're going to make sure that nobody actually uses the information yet. And once we're confident that the information is actually going to be beneficial, then we'll encourage people to use it. Our target is, yeah, so our target to get it in the clinics, uh, beta testing is the next three or four months. And then we hopefully will roll it out over the next year or so. So you, sorry, you? I'm a donor to Huffari. Okay. Participants, and I got a letter from the cancer registry saying, would you like to join? Shouldn't I have automatically have joined? So, yeah, so the, so the way we're doing it, uh, so the registry itself, currently we're recruiting at, at your visit at the, at the uh, at diagnosis, and we're also recruiting people who are in for the regular visit for follow-ups. So, so at that point, you'd be recruited for the biorepository. But I'll say, as a part of the Movember Prostate Cancer Outcomes uh, Initiative, we're actually going to be sending mailings to everyone and, and encouraging them to enroll. And then we'll probably mail you out a questionnaire so you can participate. Would it be worthwhile to have our sons in your uh, bio database, seeing as it's frequently a genetic Certainly. So, so anybody with a family history? So I would say you would probably let the family doctor decide whether uh, it's, it's appropriate because we're, we're interested in enrolling people when they're, they're going to get a biopsy. Obviously, you don't want a biopsy if you don't need one. So <laughs> only at the point where a biopsy seems to be necessary is the time you'd enroll. Yeah. But certainly anybody who you know who is at risk and is thinking, or is thinking they may be going for a biopsy, I certainly encourage them. Louis? I have to give credit for you for the amount of effort and the success you have. And the amount of participants, 1,600, that's quite mm -hmm. a bit. I'd like to know what kind of obligation you have if we send out sample mm -hmm. to whatever research, yep. like Australia for the same argument. Absolutely. So they come back to you. Out of 100, one of them is really in bad shape. So what would be your obligation for them? So, yeah, so there's, a, there's actually a few issues in there, right? So, so when, when a patient consents to have their samples taken, so unfortunately under the ethics, the ethics board won't allow us to report back the results of the test to the patient. Although we can report those test results back to the doctor, until we have done a clinical trial to demonstrate what that result means, then we can't report it back. It isn't validated, so we can't report it back to the patient. So that's important to know. So generally when you're giving a sample, you're giving it uh, to benefit someone else in the future. You can't necessarily expect to get benefit back, although it, it's possible that it will eventually. Um, the other thing is our responsibility for those samples and, and that information. So we obviously take that very seriously. Um, we, uh, so we have uh, a proposal to test the diagnostics that I've talked about today. We have a proposal that's approved by ethics that's part of the consent form that patients sign uh, that, uh, that obviously has been looked at by many people. So it's sort of, it's rigorous. Uh, for any, anybody that's coming in and applying, we have a scientific committee then that reviews all the applications that includes a biostatistician that will make sure that there's enough, you know, enough samples and they can actually answer the question. And the question's important and if we get the answer, it'll be important. Uh, pay, or, sorry, groups that get the samples and then test them uh, are also required to report back on the results. So we get, we find out what, what the results are and are involved potentially in, the, in the moving that research forward. Yeah. The question about your uh, your tumor drug and some of its history. Uh, it op was it a compound that existed previously for some other uh, uh, use, and you identified it. And what would be the um, proprietary issues associated with that particular? It's drug? actually a complicated story, maybe over a beer, but <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> Okay, good for you. <laughs> Me too. I've been off it for about three weeks. <laughs> uh, so that's a good question. So the original tumor glue drug was actually identified by, by uh, uh, Stony Brook University. So they, they discovered it, and then later in 2008, we validated that it works for metastasis. Um, unfortunately, that exact drug uh, will give you massive blood clots if you just inject it. 
So part of our research is developing a version of it that doesn't have that side effect. What we've also done though, which is a whole new talk unto itself, we've done additional in vivo screening because now we've identified what this drug does, so it creates sticky cells. We've done a screen to actually look at all of the other things that do the same thing. And we've come up with a list of about 13 new genes and targets that basically create the same situation. And several drugs have already been developed that are being used for other things. So one of them is a brain drug. And so we're looking at now about repurposing those drugs to try to create the same effect. My question was similar. Okay, um, yeah. I was trying to get the link between your tumor glue target and the 15 years and the $1 billion that's needed. And then when you went on to the rest of your, your talk, uh, I was trying to get the connection. So you're not really developing the super glue to get it to a clinical trial? We absolutely are. You are? We yeah. are. So the, the vision of the program is to develop a diagnostic to predict, predict which patients will develop metastasis and then develop a drug to, to give to that population. So, so the long-term goal of the group is to develop a drug, for sure. So how far are you away from first in the page? So, so we are, we are in, uh, so we are in preclinical proof of concept with one sort of new drug based on these new screens. So it may be, it's probably a year and a half, two years away from people. So phase one. So fortunately, uh, UVA has a, has a phase one program. So we could potentially do the pre-phase one and phase one right at, at, in Alberta. Yeah. My question is about prostate cancer recurrence. And um, a number of us here have had radical surgery and survived that. Yeah. Um, and some of us for a number of years. But it's, it seems to be a, a worrisome time now with what we hear. And I see the Mayo Clinic health letter that's just come out for May gives some rather you know, frightening numbers, if you like, that 30% uh, of those who've had radical surgery will uh, have their PSA rise rather than stay that's right, yeah, that's about right. Yeah. And 30% of those will require surgery and uh, you know some other t uh, some other treatment perhaps yes yeah. um, this is an American study obviously um, is your initiative doing uh, similar statistics on recurrence absolutely yep yeah. so that's what the outcomes uh, program is all about so we're calculating all the outcomes throughout Alberta and then we're also sharing or comparing those outcomes worldwide uh, but the the diagnostics we're coming up with ideally will identify those patients, those subset of patients, the 30% of the 30%, so that they can be treated aggressively initially. Because actually, and this is a bit of a scary thought, but what we think probably is that those prostate cancers have already metastasized before surgery. And they're taking a few years to grow, but that's what's coming back. No other questions? Oh, one more. <laughs> Are you going to like mention a little more about your, your forum, you know, your meeting, you know, who is qualified for how much this kind of Oh, so uh, everyone's welcome to come. No, it's a, it's a bit of an internal meeting. So, so it's a research meeting for us. We, so we, invite, uh, we invite sort of delegates from our, the different interest groups. So P, uh, Prostate Cancer Canada Network may send somebody from Edmonton and somebody from Calgary. Uh, it's amazingly a research meeting for us to share our research results, but also talk about initiatives that would affect Prostate Cancer Canada Network, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. But you're certainly aware we have more and more people live twittering, tweeting about it, so you can follow it. And also, we write about it uh, quite a bit on our blog as well, so you can follow it. Yep. Thanks. All right, thanks, everybody. John, yeah, thank you very much. Great. Well done.